Hi everyone, thank you so much Justin for the introduction and thank you Shubhanshu for the very insightful presentation, I learned a lot. So, and thank you all for joining me here today. So, what we're going to be learning is uh, about how to build machine learning model for demand forecasting. So, let's get started. As Justin said, I'm Sylvia and I work as a data scientist at LinkedIn. And this is my first week at LinkedIn actually, so exciting times. So, before joining LinkedIn, I was working at Stemly which is a startup uh, here in Singapore, interacting closely with their customers and translating their business needs into machine learning models. Um, my main focus was building forecasting models for our customers. So using one of our projects that I worked on in the past year, we can learn how to apply machine learning to forecasting. Let's, let's go for it. So there are a lot of similarities uh, between building a model for the time series forecasting and any other task, whether that's a classification or a regression task. So the steps are data processing, uh, then we might want to do some feature engineering, hyperparameter tuning, we then validate our predictions and we analyze the predictions at the end. So the main difference between forecasting and any other task is uh, on the feature engineering validation and uh, analysis stages, which is what we're, what we're gonna go and cover in the next 10 minutes. So the project that we will be focusing on today is a demand forecasting problem. So it's in the supply chain domain. So for those of you in the audience like me two years ago who do not really know how, how our favorite products end up in the shelf or on our shoppy cart, let's take a look at a simple diagram of the supply chain. So here we can see the flow of goods from raw material to consumer, first passing through the supplier's hands, then in the factory of the manufacturer, and then the finished goods are distributed to the, by the distributors to the retailers, and then they end up in the consumer's hands. So in, the pro in this project specifically, we want to focus on the manufacturer to distributor link, and we will refer this, uh, to this flow as shipment quantity. So the task at hand, more specifically, is to help the manufacturer know how many units of each product the distributor will buy every day for the next 12 weeks. So put yourself on the shoes of the uh, manufacturer who wants to know how many shampoos the distributor is going to be ordering every day for the, ne for the next 10 weeks. So what does shipment exactly mean? So here with shipment, as we mentioned, we mean how many units the distributor will ask me, the manufacturer, to send them. So that's our target variable. So now that we know the target variables and we have historical data for this, are we just good to go? It's a little bit difficult. And before we dive into which model will do best and show off our knowledge of the most complex deep learning <laughs> networks, so let's see what factors actually understand, uh, what factors influence our target variable. So forecasting is a little bit of an art and it's currently done in most companies through simple technology like Excel, but relying on years and years of personal experience uh, by the demand planners. So the key of an effective model is actually understanding which factors will end up affecting your demand. So what would you personally consider first if you want to if you wanted to know how many bottles of shampoo the distributor in Malaysia is going to ask me tomorrow. So an example would be, oof, let's see if, yes, I, <laughs> I got it to show up. Yeah. So one possible factor would be how many, uh, how many units are the distributor themselves going to sell to the retailer when in a flow of quantity that we call sell out. Of course, the number of shampoos that I currently have on hand is going to play a role. I might not have to produce as many if I have already a lot. And what about the distributor's current inventory? If they overstock last month, they're not going to be ordering as many uh, next month. And of course, all of these factors are affected by price, promotion, and market conditions at every step of the way. So the question is, how do we encode these features? And once do we encode them, are we done? I mean, not really. So let's take a step back and think about how we can encode this time series data for a tree based model, for example. So each row is characterized by a date and ID. 
for each ID and date combination, there's a target variable. In our case, we call this volume, which is our shipment. So you can join whatever information you'd like on the ID and date. You can join the product information, the price information, location, temp temperature of that day, if you join it on the on date, for example. But how do we encode the sequential nature of the time series, which is a difference, which is the key difference between time series data and image or text? So the way that we do it is that we add lags. So what was the quantity yesterday? We call that lag one. How about two days ago? That's lag two. So similarly, you can calculate a lot of features based on the time series itself. So the key to understand uh, um, how people do currently forecast is understanding what affects the demand, we said. So let's first make a hypothesis. Then we run an analysis to verify the hypothesis on which feature will make the most sense. Analysis is super important. Is your data seasonal? Is it intermittent or is it smooth? It is really important not to get married to your hypothesis. Your model is the one that will tell you whether a feature is relevant or maybe not as much. So make sure you do feature selection. So let's go through some of the examples of the features. So some examples of features that we talked about are the external data features, like sellout inventory price, all of the ones that we talked about. But there are also intrinsic features that we mentioned earlier, which are the lags or the moving average of the volume, for example, and then other statistical um, uh, features like kurtosis and skewedness that might remind you of your stat courses back in university, uh, or like differences and derivatives, which are actually time series. So instead of encoding just one number, like a lag one, I might want to say, OK, what was the difference between yesterday and today? And that would be the difference one. And then the difference two would be the, mm, the difference between two days ago and one uh, and yesterday. So you can have a ton of different features. So for each feature, it's really important that you consider a few questions. So for each uh, date and ID combination, which quantity of the feature do you want to consider? That's the time frame. Do you want to consider the same dates? Do you want to consider the cumulative value for that week? Or maybe you want to consider 28 days before that value, because you need 28 days for the lead time. So for features like lags and uh, some other uh, difference in feature, which are time series themselves, you might want to consider how many units of time do you actually want to consider? Do you want to consider all of the time series for the last 30 days? Or maybe for the last year? Or maybe do you want daily data or do you want weekly data? So all of these are decisions that you want to make based on the business context that you have, based on your understanding of how this product actually behaves. Then once you have these features, you have your feature dictionary, let's understand the relevance, determine the feature importance. Is the feature importance what you expected? Is it what your business owner expected, the person who knows the most about how these products behave from the business standpoint? And if not, does this make sense? Does your input make, uh, insights make sense once you take a look at the data? If they don't, then there's something wrong with your code, so let's go back to feature engineering. Something that is incredibly important that you should consider is, do, will you have this data at prediction time? So for example, let's say that you want to forecast the sales of umbrellas. And you know what? What's a better predictor than the weather for the sales of umbrellas? It makes sense, right? So you want to do a forecast for the next month, daily sales. But then, when you do the forecast, you need to, put, you need to know what the weather will be then. And that you don't really know. So should you use the weather, the weather data in your, for, in, your, in your forecasting exercise? Maybe you want to use the weather forecast, but there's a lot of uncertainty in that. So what are the implications? Consider it carefully. So now you have all of your features. But do you know how your model works? We need to compare our forecast with the actuals. So some of the error metrics that we, that we use in time series forecasting are similar to what you've seen in, in, our, in our, for other tasks. Shubanshu might use these ones too. So we have MAE, 
Here's the mean absolute error and RMSE, the root mean squared error. In both of these, you're taking a difference between the actuals, A, and forecast, F. And in one case, you're taking the absolute difference. In the other case, you're squaring it and then taking a square root and doing some averages, just so we can have one number. So now imagine this. You have to go to your business owner and tell them, look, our forecast has an error of 3 or 10. OK, thanks. What does that mean in terms of the impact of my business? Is 10 good? Is 3 good? What? So that's why everyone loves MAPE. So MAPE is the mean absolute uh, percentage error. And like the name says, what we do is that we take a difference between absolute uh, between actuals and forecast, and then we divide it by the actuals. So the business lawyers love it, but the data scientists hate this metric. And can you tell why? So what happens if AT is zero? Yeah, <laughs> bad things happen when <laughs> you're dividing things by zero. So another issue is that uh, under forecasting and over forecasting are not equally penalized. Think about it, left as an exercise for the reader, for the watcher. So there are, that's why there are a lot of metrics that um, try to walk around mm, these, uh, these shortcomings that we highlighted just now. Uh, so I'm putting a few a few actual metrics that end up being used more often. So some of them scale the error instead of scaling by the actual, they scale it by a naive understanding of it, or uh, some of them weigh up the error by some more business friendly quantities like the price or the, the revenue. So those are the weighted metrics that you see with the W there. So you could stop now, but you probably, you probably have the different models are better for different products or dates. Maybe you have that uh, an LGBM model tra uh, trained only on shampoo, does really well for the shampoos. Or for Singapore products, the Singapore trained model is better. Or maybe you know that for shampoo specifically in Singapore, the best ones, uh, the best model is the one that has only seen shampoos in Singapore. Or maybe an Arima model will be, which is a statistical model like SES, Will, will do much better with a different, uh, for some types of products. So if only we could choose the best model for each of the IDs, but we kind of can. So how about we build a model that chooses which model to choose? That's very meta. We call these ensembles. So the idea is to train very different models and put their errors as training data for a stronger learner that then decides based on the error which model to choose in the right circumstances. So this is when diversity becomes extra important. The more diversity, the better the accuracy. Because sometimes a simple exponential smoothing is all, what you need, is, is all that you need. So with this technique, uh, we delivered 10% improvement in the client's already best, uh, best in class forecast accuracy. So this recipe ended up working for us. Let's see. Yeah, I hope you learned uh, something about the final forecasting model for demand forecasting and which guiding questions are important when interacting with your customers. So it's time to test it out and let, let me know what uh, percentage accuracy you get. Time series forecasting is really everywhere. I mean, stock prices are time series. Hint, hint. It's not an easy problem, but there's a lot uh, to learn al uh, along the way. So what are the steps? Let's recap a little bit. So first thing, understand the business requirements and the structure. What are you trying to solve exactly? Then choose your features very carefully. Validate your results for future accuracy. And then make sure that you diversify your models. You consider different opinions. Diversity is always uh, a good thing. And then optimize again, not just for the, for, for the most relevant metric for your business. So keep that in mind. And I'm sure uh, you're, you'll give me a success story. So write to me what your end up, uh, what your percentage accuracy would be. And uh, if you have any questions, drop them in the comments section. And if you want to learn more about time series forecasting, check out uh, what Stemly does uh, uh, in their blog at stemly.ai slash blog. And, uh, or in my LinkedIn profile, connect with me on LinkedIn and make sure you add a note to remind me where we met.
So good luck with forecasting. Um, SC is asking, um, I think for the formulas that you shared earlier, um, which metric do you use for which purpose? Yeah, that's a really, that's the really important question. And I decide which one to use based on who I'm talking to and what exactly I'm doing. So if I'm, if I'm fine tuning the forecasting model for my, for my own purpose, so let's say that I have three different models, then I want to see which one performs better for a certain product, then I might use one of those, uh, usually I use weighted RMSE or the SNAP, which is like the symmetric MAPE, like the, like the percentage, but make sure, making sure that over forecasting and under forecasting are treated equally. But if I'm presenting to a stakeholder, then, and this metrics might be a little bit too complicated to explain, then I might end up using MAPE, because sometimes that's what the business uses and that's what they want to hear. Or I try to introduce them to one of the simpler metrics and then link it to their business. So it really depends on what I'm trying to achieve. But uh, the most important thing is that the person that you're talking to has to be able to be on the same page as you. Otherwise, there's no communication. Mm. Yeah, SC, we hope that answers your question. Um, we have another one from Esther. Um, she asks, what about outliers? Is that important and how do you address that? That's really important. Good. Yeah, very good question, Esther. So the first thing that you do is actually should, when you do the analysis, you should remove the outliers. So do a bit of an outlier detection and there are multiple techniques to do that. Uh, because once you put your data through the machine learning black box, then the outliers might create problems. But you need to be very careful because sometimes those outliers are actually what you want. Like, for example, if you take a look at 11.11 um, sales, those are definitely outliers. But if you, if you were to just remove them, you would lose a lot of the signal. So what we, you might want to do instead is build a model to detect those outliers and build a model that, to, to predict everything else. So you have a very powerful model that is really good at predicting 11.11 sales, mm -hmm. and then you have a model for your everyday sales. Nice. Um, OK, I think another question from Geraldine. Um, so she asked, um, thanks for sharing. What do you think about packages like TS Fresh for automatically generating time series features? Oh, that's always my starting point. Uh, the, the, I import the most amount of packages possible. All the, all the I create my feature dictionary that is huge, so that then I can select down and really figure out which ones are the ones that work best for this specific use case. But sometimes the, um, some of these features are really abstract and not really relevant to the use case of that specific client, which might have always a six month lead period. Then you might want to focus specifically on those type of features. And you might want to always add some additional ones, uh, like the external data features from the sellout data or the price that the customer might have. And those actually end up being much more important than the out-of-the-box features, unfortunately. 